Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. We've come to day 447, which is 2 Samuel 24 is the passage we're at today. And um, looking forward to getting into this last chapter of 2 Samuel. Let's ask the Lord's help together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, perfect and holy word, helpful and profitable word. Show us Jesus and strengthen our faith in you. Help us to walk more closely with you and to see the patterns that you have laid down for us in scripture that we might walk in your ways and not in our own foolishness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 24. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he incited David against them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and number the people that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my lord the king will see it. But why does the lord, the, my lord the king, delight in this thing? But the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. They crossed the Jordan and began from Aror and from the cities that, that is in the middle of the valley toward Gad and on to Jazer. Then they came to Gilead and to Kadesh in the land of the Hittites, and they came to Dan, and from Dan they went around to Sidon, and they came to the fortress of Tyre, and to all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites. They went up out of the Negev at Judah at Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to the king in Israel, there were 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and said to him, Shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time, and there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep... What have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. So David went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded. And when Aruna looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And Aruna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the lord, that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Aruna said to David, Let my lord the king take 
and offer up what seems good to him. Here are oxen for the burnt offering, and the threshing sledges, and the yoke of the oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aruna gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. But the king said to Aruna, No, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David built the threshing floor and the oxen, bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the pleas for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. This place, by the way, would become the floor of the temple where Solomon would build the temple and where sacrifices would be offered. And it's, it's likely the same place or very close to the same place where Abraham had offered up Isaac and it's very nearby to the place where Jesus would carry his cross and die for the sins of his people. It's all in that same uh, general area uh, just outside of what was then Jerusalem. So this is 2 Samuel chapter 24, and I want to show you something that might help you understand the structure of what's going on here a bit. Uh, these closing chapters of 2 Samuel uh, function as a postlude. Once we get to the end of chapter 20 and the end of the resolution of the, the Absalom uh, incident, the last four chapters of the book really form a postlude. They're not in chronological order. Some of them open with in the days of David as king or in the days when David was king. And what we have here is we begin with a section um, about the Gibeonites and how the land was struck with a plague because of the Gibeonites. And it ends with how the land was struck with a plague because of David's census. So it begins and ends with judgment from God. The next section in the second section and the second from last section are uh, accounts of the mighty men and their deeds. And then the middle two sections are David's Psalms, uh, chapter 22, which is his long song of deliverance um, at the outset of his reign when he had been delivered from the hand of Saul. And then the last one, his song of salvation at the conclusion of his reign, which is much shorter. Um, and it's when he's old, it's his last song. So, uh, the Psalm 20 or Second Samuel 22 is in many ways his first great psalm as king, and then chapter 23 is his last great psalm as king. So this forms what we call a chiasm, or because it's shaped like an X in the Greek letter chi is X shaped, in that you have parallelisms between the first and the last, and the second and the second to last, and then the two middle ones. And in the chiasm, this, this, the emphasis is always on what's in the middle. So David is the psalm singer. In fact, the second of those two songs that we looked at yesterday identifies him as the sweet psalm singer of Israel. So David is a psalmist, and it's his psalms that have lasted for 3,000 years as most remembered and most helpful to God's people and the very word of God on his lips. So that's the heart of it. The heart of David, as a man after God's own heart, is reflected in the psalms that he wrote. But David was also a man of war. That's the reality of David as a man of war. And so his mighty men frame outside of that. And then David was also a sinner. And uh, his sin and the sins of others caused great judgment during his reign. And so sin frames that as well. So these are the three themes of this, of this uh, postscript or postlude of the book. So that brings us to chapter 24, where we see sin and its devastating cost. This is one where we think, what's the big deal? He just had a census. We do a census in America every 10 years. At times, God commanded his people to take a census of the people. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that David, as a man after God's own heart, David is one who knows that he is to rely on the Lord and who writes beautiful things about the Lord is my strength and my salvation. He's my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. I call upon his name and so I am saved from my enemies. David, who knows all of this and wrote all of this and sang all of this and lived all of this, still wants to rely on the size and strength of his army. He still wants to know, how many men can I muster for battle if someone comes at us? And that is sinful. That is wicked. 
That is self-reliance and not God-reliance. That is self-centered, self-focused, and not God-centered and God-focused. And it is wicked. And God calls it out as such. It's so wicked that even Joab, who's done some wicked things, isn't comfortable really carrying it out. He doesn't really want to do it. But he does it. And God brings judgment. And the judgment is severe. 70,000 people. So it's a, it's a very significant. They were supposed to be subject to three days of pestilence. I want you to catch that. In verse 13, one of the options was three days of pestilence. And this is essentially the one that David chooses. But they're not even subject to pestilence for a full day. It's from the morning until the appointed time, probably the appointed time for the evening sacrifice. And so it's part of a day. And 70,000 men fall. Uh, to fall into the hands of the Lord. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of of a holy God. And so David sins and David and all of Israel suffers the consequences of the sin. But then David does something beautiful, which is a picture of what ultimately God would provide. Well, on this land, a thousand years earlier, just about, David had David's great, 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 great grandfather was called to offer up his son. A sacrifice that would cost him the most precious thing he had. And ultimately God stopped him. Because that's not what God was, was going to require from his people. But God would provide that. And here God asks David to buy this floor. This threshing floor of Arun of the Jebusite. He's a Jebusite. He's a foreigner. It's very interesting that he plays a key role here. Uh, an alliance between a foreigner and, and, a, and an Israelite, or a foreigner might mean someone outside of the covenant people of God. And so here they are together, and David buys the floor and buys the oxen and buys 50 shekels of silver he pays. Remember, Jesus was betrayed for 30 shekels of silver, and he offers up the sacrifice, and the plague is averted. It's a picture of intercession the picture of sacrifice that turns away the wrath of God, which is a picture of propitiation. Propitiation is a sacrifice that satisfies divine justice and turns away justly deserved wrath. And that's ultimately what Jesus would provide. Jesus provides that for us very close by to that same place on the cross under the condemnation of God for our sin. He willingly makes intercession and it costs him everything. And because of that, we are forgiven by the greater son of David. And that's why the arc of David's story ends here. Here on the place of sacrifice, here with the sacrifice that makes intercession, here with the propitiation that is a foreshadowing of the great work of salvation that David's greater son would bring to us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus, our Savior. Thank you that his death is perfectly sufficient to forgive us of all of our sins and to save us from all of the wrath that we deserve. Fill us with your spirit and help us to walk after you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that is 2 Samuel. We've come to the end of it. We're going to pop back over to the book of Acts tomorrow and pick up with Acts chapter 5. Hope you can join me for that. And as always, I hope you have a blessed day in the Lord. Mm -hmm.